Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Lockwood, and I'm your host for the Inclusion Bites podcast. In this series, I have interviewed a number of amazing people and simply had a conversation around the subject of inclusion, belonging, and generally making the world a better place for everyone to thrive. If you'd like to join me in the future, then please do drop me a line to joe.lockwood at stchangehappen.co.uk. That's S-E-E, changehappen.co.uk. You can catch up with all of the previous shows on iTunes, Spotify, and the usual places. So plug in your headphones, grab a decaf, and let's get going. Today is episode 72, with the title, Leaving No Stone Unturned. And I have the absolute honour and privilege to welcome Arno St. Paul. Arno describes himself as a tapawat, which means eternal rebirth. And when I asked Arno to describe his superpower, he said, leading harmony into people's lives. Hello, Arno. Welcome to the show. Hello, Joan. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an honor Ah, as well. It's a pleasure. So, Arno, we're just talking in the green room before we came live about leaving no stone unturned. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Well, it's a very good question and a very good title. The, I guess... Probably that this method that I created for the past 30 years is really about leaving no stone unturned. Uh, in other words, helping me understand how I am having or how I is having this human experience, understanding how this life of ours is uh, articulated and works. What's, what's the framework within which it, uh, it functions? Why is it that I am going through patterns again and again and again throughout my life, situations repeating themselves? Why is it that I feel sometimes limited, sometimes I feel free? Why is it that sometimes I may feel sad and other moments happy? And uh, what if there could be a, a, a global understanding, a framework that enables me to make sense of all of that? And, uh, you know, that has been my whole life to uh, turn all the stones as, m- as many as I can so that that whole thing that we call life starts to make sense to me and then I can share it with other people. So Does you've that been mean? working, yeah, you've been working on this for 38 years, you say. Yes. Um, I think that's incredible. I, I've, I guess I'm, I just do life i haven't i haven't actually sat there and analyzed as you say the the repeating pattern as you say of happiness sadness financial wealth financial Mm -hmm. challenges um we come in cycles through our lives and we seem to want as i think you were saying basically a roller coaster of Mm -hmm. emotions and experiences and challenges Mm -hmm. and i'd never i'd never thought of that I, i just thought it was kind of like inevitable that when things are going well you're going to have a bump but why? Not necessarily. And to expand on what you just said, yes, it is about the, your experience, but it's also about the patterns of the actual events and situations and conversation you have. They tend also to repeat themselves across time uh, until the moment you start to make a conscious choices that free you from, from that pattern. So it's understanding these keys on how life is talking to me and how I can un- unwind the, uh, the reason why these patterns exist. So, yeah, why do we tend to insist in living them? That is very puzzling to me now um, because there's a way. How, how much are these cycles are within your control? Are we living in a world where politics, climate, uh, seasons of the year all have an impact on our experiences? Or are you thinking that a lot of these things are are actually within our control and how we react, how we deal with them, allow us to take take power back, if you like? Right. Well... Yes, there are these cycles and then there are the cycles of, you know, the more individual cycles or for a company cycle as well. 
uh, for teams as well. So cycles from an individual standpoint, it can be just the passage of age, right? Uh, the 20 years, the 20, the 30 years old and so on, or the cycle of having kids and then not having kids. Uh, the cycle of uh, going through the 40 years old uh, uh, crisis, right? <laughs> just to take these examples, and there are so many and they are all overlapping one another. Um, so all these cycles, the ones you, you described and the ones I was just uh, listing out there, we all have control about them, on them. Uh, yeah, so let me refine what control is. What I mean by that is now, obviously, you cannot control what is happening in the U.S. right now and uh, the political situation or the war in Ukraine and whatnot. No, obviously not. In the same way that you cannot control the discussion with the boss or with your partner or whatever. No way. Uh, what you do control, though, is the fact that you can, at any moment in time, um, forego this habit of uh, being on autopilot, meaning instead of reacting to any situation, events, conversation, uh, thought, emotion, you can make a pause and make a choice from that place. So in other words, you have taken the time and the space within you to reposition yourself and find the foundation from which you can declare uh, in truth to yourself in that moment, this is what I choose. And that makes a whole world of difference. And we can apply that to everything. There's no reason why not, right? And that's an amazing freedom that we all have, but we, you know, most of us do not act upon it funnily enough. Yeah, as you're talking now, I'm thinking about an incident in my life where yes. I had this I had this same realization that if I if I didn't change anything, my life would continue as it was. And I'm not saying my life was unhappy or it needed to change specifically for many reasons, but there was one thing in my life that did need to change. And I think the, the, the momentum you have in your life sometimes stops you from from making decisions because you have responsibilities as you say children house mortgage family expectations status um all these kind of things in your life uh, money income um and there's this fear of disrupting that continuum um mm. by making a radical change and i and i think as you say we, we get into our 40s and we, we sometimes look over our shoulder and go well I've come a long way, but I'm not sure I want to keep going in this direction to so the midlife crisis, the reevaluation mm -hmm. of our relationships, the children maybe leaving home, our maturity, our, we, we, our political allegiance sometimes changes and what, what matters to us changes. But still, we're, we can, can be apprehensive to, and I, I describe it as whacking the stop button. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know if you've ever flown from Gatwick Airport in London. But there's this massive, great big long travelators, and you get on at the you, you, the taxi drops you off, and you get on this travelator. It goes on for about hundred yards, and you have to get off and get on another one, get off, get on another one. And I, the metaphor I use is I was I was going to Malaga on holiday, and I got to about the end of the second travelator, and I thought I don't want to go to Malaga on holiday. I want to go somewhere else. Let's <laughs> press that stop button, get all my luggage off the, off this conveyor belt, and just put it on the side and stop and have a think what do I really want to do with my life? Mm -hmm. And some might say that I made a radical choice. I, I gender transitioned to that point, which was a complete reorientation of my entire being and everybody around me. But then I got back on that conveyor belt, having redefined who I was. And then now went, now I get it. Now I'm happy. And I, I can now take this kind of helicopter view of my life and realize I can make decisions and not just be guided by what I'm expected to do without any control. So what you're saying that really resonates with my own lived experience and, and, and how and I see things. I'm going to dive deeper on that. What you just mentioned, and thank you for sharing, is actually there's an underlying fear uh, related to making a, a, a conscious choice, which is to redefining my own identity. 
Because the moment I am starting to make a conscious choice, I am asking myself, is it that I am really that now? Or do I want to be something else, someone else? Or, you know, just be maybe more open and, and positive about life or whatever. And then so I, I start, sit for a second with who is it that I want to be and then make a step, right? Take a step towards whatever it is and then mm. explore, discover what is there to be uh, found about myself. So that's probably the most scary aspect, right? Um, and to take that responsibility of me being me and uh, letting go of the blaming, the being the victim of, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, that's why so it is so difficult for so many to take that journey, and that journey affects absolutely everything. And in your story, you really demonstrate it beautifully. I mean, to change your whole identity is amazing, uh, but it actually implies so many aspects of your life, including the series of events that are happening beyond, beyond that, whichever small or big choice you're making. And by making a conscious choice, we actually embark on an ascendi ascending journey towards myself instead of a constraining one. And that's, you know, when we're on autopilot, it's the, the energy pool is so strong that I, by default, I am here to continue that journey, as you were saying earlier, but it is also restraining itself gradually. You know, it's losing entropy. And uh, when you do make a conscious choice, then all of a sudden you give yourself more power, more freedom, and you can really expand and explore other sides of yourself. And mm. I believe this is the most beautiful gift that one can give to oneself. I think it is it's giving yourself permission to decide not who you want to be. I wouldn't say deciding who you want to be, but who you really are inside. Indeed. And there's that misalignment between your core values, your core identity, the expectations that people have of you and your 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 part you play in the world and the path that you always felt you should be on because yeah, I don't know about you, but I, I, I grew up as a, with my parents guiding me in maybe in their image or their suggestions about what I should be doing in life. And you, you find, sometimes you find yourself falling into something that isn't your passion. It just, it's available. It's there. Then suddenly you meet somebody and you don't necessarily choose them. It just becomes love or becomes marriage, children start. That's so all these things kind of are these micro decisions that have a huge impact later in life that you didn't realize you were making a decision at the time. It just felt easy and natural. Mm -hmm. I think it's only when you, when you look back and say, and I, and I, I would not never say I'm unhappy. I was never unhappy. I was never had a bad life. I, I'm the product of my previous experiences and I always value my children, my, my relationships and the life I've had. It just got to a point where that life had become past its sell by date. It was that moldy sandwich at the back of a fridge. Mm -hmm. You say, well, actually, we need to throw that. Not well. I say throw it away. I didn't want to throw it away. I wanted what I wanted to do was just maybe repackage it slightly and and just give it a, a bit more fresh lettuce or something like that. <laughs> Is a and yeah, it's what you're saying is really powerful. And, and so many people tell me I was brave, and I wasn't brave. I was just honest with myself. But the bravery comes when you, when you, you you realize the impact you have on those around you, mm -hmm. and the risk of failure or, or the risk of it being really really tough. Because um, we're all scared of that that failure. We're scared of that humiliation. We're scared of 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 disrupting what people think of us, and that's the challenge, isn't it? So yeah, the as you said earlier. Uh, these conscious choices are all about deeply connecting with my own essence and being able to be as true as possible in total transparency towards myself of uh, whatever it is that I, I want to be in the world, right? And uh, so the, the I I'm talking about here has probably a broader definition. It's not just 
the I that is the role, like uh, I am the parent of, or I am of this gender, etc. But a I that encompasses the whole world and sees itself across every single aspect of it, meaning that every single experience and situation you're living. Um, and again, I'm talking about very simple things, uh, talking with the, uh, the bakery guy or, or uh, having a discussion with a partner are always a, uh, like a mirror. It brings me back an image of me. Whether there is judgment in front on the other side or not doesn't really matter. But this is how I perceive myself in this moment and how I can see what it is that I want to be in that moment because of that situation. So each moment, in essence, is independent from all the other moments. We do choose to believe and be identified to past stories and roles that we like to continue on, like, you know, like uh, having a suit and, uh, and a jacket and a, a coat and etc. We have quite a bunch of them. And we can gradually let go of them if we choose to. And that's the whole idea of being in harmony and coherence and alignment with where ourselves, right? Where we become at some point that kind of tuning fork that really expresses the purest vibration of who you are in the world and for the world and being really the vehicle of expression of life, right? As it is in its purest and rawest aspect. And when that happens, we are completely free of anything that was constraining us. Mm. And maybe we're walking in the nude because we don't have any mother coat and, and the jacket and whatnot, uh, figuratively, obviously. Uh, but uh, in the end, you can wear any uh, garment from now on because you are um, the purest expression of who you can be. And, and, and life is there to bring us to that as much as we allow it. Life is talking to us every day that's the, the core of my, of my method to help us understand how that works and how life is talking with, to me and then how I can let go of this coat and that coat and that coat and see in the real world how this unfolds and grows. Hence the name Tapuat and Eternal Rebirth because we are in that process. The moment we do a conscious choice, we are in a rebirth, maybe a small one, uh, but still, it's one that can compound itself. I don't know if you know the term. Maybe I'm going to explain it. Uh, compounding in finance terms is oh, yes. You, know, yes. you put 2% every month on a placement, and then all of a sudden it makes a huge amount after 10 years or whatever. So it's the interest on the interest on the interest. Exactly. Every, it exponentially grows, yeah. Exactly. So here you have the same thing. Every little conscious choice has a compounding effect in the long term. And we have that in our hands. It's our magic. Everyone has that magic in themselves. Let's start doing it. It's, it's not a mindset that many people have. No. Or, or know they have. I mean, it, it takes a, I would say, a lot of self-awareness, self-actualization. It's almost like an ascension to a ne to another plane to step out of your your jacket into the nude, if you like, and say what, what feels comfortable. And that, how do we, or how do you work with people to to help them on that that plane of evolution, if you like? Well, the that's why um, you know in the past thirty years came together a series of drawings and charts that helped me understand that whole thing uh, to make sense of it. And, and about 10 years ago, I dis started discovering, talking with people about my little charts. <laughs> uh, and they started, oh, that's interesting, etc. And then I started to, to help leaders uh, in, in, and individuals in general to understand themselves. Like it's like a, a visual map of what it is to be I in this world and have this whole articulation, not only of uh, 
the other I self, but also the polarities, the masculine, the feminine, all that. How does it articulate? How does that help me in my day to day so that I can feel better and feel more in joy, in, at peace, in coherence with myself and the world? And so came together in the end uh, a, a 90 day. So it's actually nine sessions and we go through the charts and I explain them and it starts to click. And in parallel to that, we learn how to using what happens and unfolds in one's life. Like if we could take your past week and figure out the different events that happen, like the two or three events that happen during the week. And then they all have an interconnection. They are all the, uh, the, the top of the wave that we can see or the iceberg, if you wish. And there is one underlying belief system that is connecting all of them. And we, we un unlock that belief system and poof, all of a sudden you're free from it. And we repeat that, rinse and repeat every week. And, and you learn how to do it yourself, basically. And um, that's how it works. And it works amazingly um, for the people that are practicing it. I mean, there's no... Because, again, we're just in a dance with our own life and having that un new understanding, indeed, as you were saying, we're getting doing it from a new octave standpoint, so to speak, a new vibrational standpoint. And it happens. It happens. Obviously, at first, it starts a little bit more difficult, and then gradually it starts to go faster and faster and easier and easier. Much of our society our business, our family, in fact, most of the structure we, most people live in day to day relies on some level of stability, some level of conformity, some level of um, process or, or, or A follows, or B follows A, follows C and D. And is society ready for everybody to kind of self-actualize, to, to find themselves, to, to think in a, in a different plane of existence or a plane of a being. Our society at the moment relies on people having control and momentum and responsibility. And what we're saying here is I find people, people react to me a bit because I'm going, oh, hang on a minute. You've, you've, you stepped out of your, your role in your mold. Ah, how do we process that? And uh, so 99.9% .9 of the population are still living closed lives. They haven't found their tapo out their rebirth yet. How, how would it work if everybody uh, finds themselves, would all be wandering around free thinking? Is society going to work as it is? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. I believe so. I believe humanity is ready, definitely. Uh, I, I, I see so many trends that are pointing in the same direction um, in the past, in the past hundred years, as well as in the past 10 or 20 years. And so uh, let's look at a few of them uh, from a, well, from a societal standpoint, right? The, the, the birth of, uh, or the recognition, more importantly, of uh, first, women and then uh, the, the, the multi-sexual movement, and I don't know what is the exact term, but uh, and the, the LGBTQ and so on and so forth. Um, the, the birth of all that is related to, uh, in the finance world, uh, social impact investment, uh, environmental investment, etc. The communication in the educational world around the sustainable development goals of the UN, which is 20 years old, not much more than that. Um, in technology, we're seeing first the birth of the internet, which is an interconnection of every single soul on, on the planet, which is a very much a, a copy of what consciousness is about, right? And now we're seeing the not only are we going to space soon, <laughs> but more importantly, uh, we, we are getting onto a new revolution, which is the revolution of quantum computing, which is going from a, um, a framework of particles, one and zeros, that are independent one from another, to overlapping vibrations. 
that collapses when there is an observer. So that we are many, many facets of our society, and there are many more, are really showing the same thing, that humanity, even if it takes, it took it took humanity 100 years at the mass uh, market level to start to have a glimpse of what quantum physics shows. Um, and it's still moving in that direction. And COVID has been an amazing example of that too, in, in more of the negative way, but it actually has mm. a positive impact. Um, and, and so we are ready, clearly, it's still there is a long way to go, obviously, uh, for the next decades. But uh, even a project like the, the other project I'm working on is called Give Nation. It's a platform for children to become philanthropists and practice sustainable financial literacy, which is there to create a positive relationship with money and help kids to learn how to have empathy and compassion and altruism on a day to day, but from a kid from five years old onwards. So we, we are there to create huge movements. And I believe this is happening as we speak of uh, transforming our reality in something that becomes more and more coherent with our heart and less and less with the mind construct of controlling and power, et cetera. Do you think there's a generational shift? Um, yes. So we look at Gen Z, Gen Alpha, they're far more far more connected digitally. There's a lot more stresses, but they're also far more in touch with their own sense of self, their own sense of identity, and those around them. And building relationships, strong relationships with their peer group is important to them. Whereas maybe boomers and Gen Xers, millennials didn't have haven't had the same relationship in that way. Whereas in the future, they're expecting people to be connected. They expect people to to be able to, and also living in a, in, in this ever evolving metaverse this this digital footprint that we all, we all will exist in and is this is this all helping or is this is this going to complicate your your message no, no on the contrary uh yes there are these uh generation shifts as well and thank you for bringing them i forgot them and but in parallel in these same generations are kids that have a how would I put it, a higher access to consciousness? It's, it's not the right way to say it, but let's say that they have a, a higher understanding than their, the, the, the previous generation, for sure. I see so many examples. And the fact that they are more and more interconnected is actually a great benefit in the sense that it allows us to really spread out quickly um, long-term changes. Um, the, as long as we do it in the right way, obviously. And, um, and plus, you know, this world of ours that we're creating now is a world of visual where um, emotions are going to become vehicles further of, of transformation, actually. And we see with AR and with the, the multiverses and so on that these are possibility to create movements that are um, really making these changes happen. So, but obviously any system has always their pros and cons and, you know, uh, it's, it's polarities. We're in a world of contrast, so we need both, uh, but um, both are true and both are valid. The question is, what is the conscious choice we want to make related to each, right? And you have the power to make that conscious choice that everybody that has. Everybody give yourself has. permission or recognizing you have inherently permission to make those choices. Um, Even if they are and, small ones, mm. don't have to be, you know, changing the whole world, just little change. It's good. Yeah. We can all decide how we're going to react to a situation, to a statement, to somebody else's reaction to us. We all have that micro power to say, actually, not, not now or I'll smile this time. I can smile back. I can, I could be positive back. And so often, though, we're, we're so blinkered, we're so living in our moment, in our stress, in our momentum, that we don't realize those little choices, we, have, we, we, we can stop and go, as you, I think you said at the beginning, be able to pause. Yes, and, we and all have a pause button. We all have it. 
<laughs> I've got two paths. Which one do I want to take? And it doesn't matter as long as you as long as you you can always you can always go down path one and say actually this is the wrong one. I need to go the other way and go, and go back and go forwards. But somehow we always want to keep going forwards, don't we? Yes, completely. I, I remember now part of your other question prior that was very interesting as well. So sorry, I'm uh, rewinding a little bit. You are saying, if I understood correctly, in this society where we're coming from, where everything is about control and taking, taking responsibility, having responsible people and so on, how is it that we can get onto a place where everything is changing, right? And uh, so there are two things that are right, quite interesting. So yes, you see a lot of people that are, um, you know, being responsible and being whether the right CEO or the right accountant or whatever. Funny enough, from our angle, not a lot of people are actually taking the whole responsibility of themselves and their reality. So there's a little contrast there that is quite interesting. Uh, so what if we can all choose at the very least to take responsibility of ourselves to start with mm. and then from there trust that whatever may come and however society may evolve will be the right one, right? And um, now to the second part of your question, I truly believe that life is way far, far it's way more intelligent uh, and I trust much, much more life than the limited scope of the mind. What I mean by that is uh, life is always looking to bring about a solution or a question mark. And I have the, uh, the opportunity to choose if I want to answer it or, or not, as we said earlier. And when the, the flow of life is actually piloting all these individuals that have gone through the process we just mentioned of, of conscious choices, then life can continue its job <laughs> uh, to bring about the best in all these people at the same time. So, in other words, we're talking about people that are making conscious choices, that are trusting their lives, and therefore others, with all that they need to trust for. That's, I believe, a better society that is driven by love and feels supported and at peace with itself, and therefore is in tune with its own joy. I think that, yeah, it, it's it's a great vision that you're painting here, and I, I completely buy into it. And but I, I do wonder if it's opportunity of this nature is restricted almost by privilege. When you're when you lack privilege, you're worried about today. You're worried about now. Your next meal. Your your roof. Your 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 safety. Um, and when you have privilege, you have stability in your life, you have a roof, income, love, family, then you have the ability to self-actualize, you have the ability to think creatively, is it? Actually, I would defer on that. The very core of this framework and this understanding of life is one that is can only function and work in the now moment. So... Because the thing is, what we call stability is a core need of identifying with past stories that uh, uh, reinforce my sense of identity. Uh, a, a identification with expectations of the future. I'm going to receive my, my salary or whatever in the future and it's going to come my way, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, there is basically nobody in the middle. It's all spread out. My energy is all spread out between these things. And I have a lot of difficulties to actually let go of all these beautiful, shiny things that I have around me to really pinpoint to being here now in this moment to the true self that I am. When you are in survival mode, as you, as you were saying earlier, 
I don't have a choice, right? There's no choice. I have nothing to lose in the past, nothing to lose in the future. So uh, nothing to expect in the future. So, and I am actually have to live now. So what if I can help you give you some keys to shift whatever is there yet to be lost from a, a self-identity standpoint and then help you allow life to bring you to a new place? I, I completely concur. I agree with you. And as you were talking there, I was thinking that the more privilege you have, the more investment you have in the status quo, the less likely you are to change because what you have and momentum you have, you want to protect mm -hmm. because, because of your privilege or whatever you have. So in some respects, you're less likely to want to change mm -hmm. if your life appears to be satisfying and good. As, and I agree, agree again, when you say the less you have, the more you live in the moment, the more those changes are positive and you can have direct impact on your next, on your next activity by, by having a choice, whether you eat that, don't eat that, sleep here, don't sleep there. And you are making, living in the moment inherently. And, and what you're saying here is, is coming into a, a way of thinking where you are comfortable living in the moment and making these micro choices of positivity or decisions rather than just letting the momentum just take you down the stream without you having mm -hmm. any say. Mm -hmm. I do see also people that are affluent and have all this and really are diving deeper into being the, the, the their real self, so to speak. Mm. Um, but they, they are already in a growth mindset. They are already wanting to step up their game. So it's a different ballpark, but most of us will always privilege uh, focusing on what they know already instead of wanting to dabble into mm. other aspects that they don't control, so to speak. And, uh, and it's okay, right? It's just, you know, as long as you want to continue on autopilot your life, that's great. You know, that's why life is there for that. So not a problem. What if you may mm. one day uh, make a first step for yourself and, and really start exploring in a very small way or in a big one, whichever, it doesn't matter um, what it looks like to be you, but from another angle. <laughs> yeah. I, I just have reflection at the beginning of the year. I mean, like we all do, new year, new ideas, new, new resolutions, whatever. Um, I think it, it was the wake-up call I needed to think about my life. I'm, I'm currently 57 years old. And I thought, where where do I want to be when I, I, picked, I picked the age of 75 as a number? Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, at the age of 75, I want to be able to do, have the freedom to do what I want to do. So health. Um, physical um, fitness to whatever extent that means, mental acuity, um, enough uh, of, a, of, a, of a wealth or resources to be able to make choice and have freedom of choice. And it suddenly occurred to me that if I wasn't careful, I, I may not make it because it's not guaranteed for anybody. And if I did, my fitness levels, uh, my being significantly overweight, very lethargic, not doing any activity, meant that my my body um, may not be able to carry my my desired um, strategy about being able to be active. So I made a conscious decision to eat healthier, uh, stop drinking. I've, I haven't had an alcohol, I haven't drank alcohol for three hundred days now this year. Bravo! Uh, go to the gym, go swimming. I bought a bike, an e-bike, so I'm out pedaling and going around the local town. Because I realized that I couldn't wait till I was 67 to, to, to see my path to 75. Mm -hmm. I back scheduled and thought the time is today. Every day I, I, I ignore it today is one is, is a bit, I'm, I'm less fit at 75. So I had to make that decision now. And I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm, I haven't lost the weight I hope to lose, but I, I go to the gym every twice a week. I have a personal trainer. I cycle when I can and, and do things. So, Whilst I'm no nowhere near on the on the curve that I wanted to be, 
I'm certainly a long way from where I was when I started, and certainly an attitude, and I'm always thinking about it. I, I, I'll give you an example. When I joined the gym, I kind of, I kind of said to myself, I don't think about it's costing me fifty pounds per month. What I think of is if I choose to sit on the sofa and not go to the gym, I'm paying sofa tax. I'm paying fifty pound <laughs> per month to sit on the sofa. <laughs> so I've reframed this. So every time I go to the gym, an hour on the sofa costs less, <laughs> and rather than the gym costing less. It's, it's, so I can make positive choices with my life. I park. I park further away, so I walk further to something. I don't try and take the easy option. If I'm, mm. if I've got to catch the train, I make sure I park farther away than the train station. I try and walk, and not get the not get the tube or not get the bus if I can. I try and take the stairs, not the escalator. So I'm making these little choices towards my big goal of being Nick. able to enjoy life at 75. And that's that was my this year's stop button, if you like, that I need to make these positive choices. Amazing. And it happens that you, you are now the amazing fit person you are going to be at 75. So you don't need to, even to wait to be 75 because you are now living it already. Yeah, I, 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 said, I said to my, 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 my physical training instructor when on my first induction lesson, she said to me, what's your goal of doing this? And I said, I gave her the same story about being at 75. And I said, I want to be able to go on a cycle ride and come back going, wow, I really enjoyed that. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a stress, a struggle. I want to be able to walk up a hill near where I live, get to the top and go, wow, what a view, and come back home and go, I really enjoyed that. I can do that today, but I come back and go, I'm really tired. I'm really, oh, I enjoyed it, but I'm absolutely drained. Mm. So I just want to make that, that feeling of exhaustion decrease. That's what I'm mm -hmm. looking for. So when I come back, I could do it again. Let's do it again now. And, and it's, mm. that's, that's the kind of the little micro change of the, the impact it's going to have on my life is, is to be able to do the things I enjoy and, and feel that I could keep doing them all the time. And I, I don't feel that I have to sort of persuade myself that I should do it really. I'm doing it because I love it and I enjoy it and I know the feeling I'm going to get at the end of it. So that, that's kind of the, the the way I framed it in my head about why I want to do this. And so the why is clear. I know mm -hmm. why I'm doing it. I know exactly what, what I'm trying to achieve. And I, listen to what you're saying is you can make those decisions about other aspects of the life, whatever that may be. Any aspect. Absolutely any aspect. Indeed. Beautiful example. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, uh, I, I I often get people asking me about oh, so you stopped drinking? It's like it's almost like there's that, that they haven't. So it's almost like they don't trust you anymore. Why? Why did you stop drinking? Why? <laughs> it's like they they want this big preaching thing. I said, well, my choice is I don't want to have a drink today. It just so happens there's been three hundred days when I decided not to have a drink, mm -hmm. and tomorrow I'll make the same decision. I won't have a drink. I've got mm -hmm. an app on my phone. Every day I wake up and I go, not drunk yesterday, not drunk yesterday. And mm -hmm. I got, I track it. And I've got to the point now where I think I passed 300 days last week. I thought, if I have a drink today, that's 300 resets. I've now got an investment in the <laughs> momentum. So I've got a new momentum and a new way of thinking. I've now invested in that mm. as a life choice. Mm. And to have a drink means that I've negated all that I've done so far. And I can see what I lose, and I and I and I because I want to hit four hundred, I want to hit five hundred, I want to hit a <laughs> thousand, and I don't want to have to start again. So it's kind of I've created these little mini benchmarks in my life. Um, I measure my waist, I measure my thighs, I measure all the inches, I measure my weight, but I'm I'm not focusing on that at the moment. So I'm thinking about so I've got data to back up my my plan because I, I do like a bit of data sometimes, but it, it allows me to see where I'm coming and going. And so whilst it's, it's, it's a bit more cerebral mistness, maybe the, maybe the free thinking, because I have still got rules in there, but it's allowing me to sort of visualize and realize what I want what to what achieve. So, mm -hmm. and I think we all can do this, you know, we, we, if we don't do something, we'll keep doing what we've always done. And I think we've got to decide what's important in our lives, uh, mm -hmm. in our work, in our family, whatever it may be. And not just accept that our trajectory is is fixed in stone. Yeah, and 
Actually, an, another example came to, to my mind, uh, working with a CEO. Um, he, so, you know, the place where we all measure everything are companies, right, and businesses. And, um, and so how does a conscious choice, beyond the, 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 the examples you just gave, how does a conscious choice actually make a difference from a business standpoint? And uh, so, again, that, that example of a CEO that I was working with for the past three years, and uh, so every week we meet and we decipher these um, events that are important and understand what is unfolding in that week. And the problem the, the company had uh, was that they were pre-revenue. It had, was like three months that they were not able to actually make it happen. And they had on the table uh, eight-figure contracts. Uh, it's in finance. And... They were not able to carry it out. No way, for whatever reason. Right? Always there was an incident of this and that. Uh, and, and so uh, that week there were a series of events pointing to the relationship between the CEO and his company. Company being, you know, an entity itself. Like you and I, you know, a company is a consciousness, right? Or, or spirit at the very least. And... Um, and so that relationship between the founder and that, that consciousness of the company was a little bit skewed in the sense that the CEO wanted to control everything, right? As we usually do most of the time. And in that case, it was a fear of the feminine that goes into chaotic mode once in a while and, you know, blows up everything. And, uh, and then she's uh, after a while a little bit more tranquil uh, and uh, and so hence the need for the masculine to say you know i control everything etc yes however the company also needs to blossom right if you don't free her for her to be able to grow on its own then there is no chance it actually can grow and that's what was actually unfolding because the anything that is uh, yeah, anything that is in your uh, reality, right, is of the feminine principle. That's why I was uh, equating mm. the consciousness of the company as a feminine in this case. And so we unlocked that. So we went through, you know, letting go of that belief of I need to control the chaos of, uh, of the, the feminine polarity or energy. And the next week they signed a nine-figure contract. And, and off they go, and they were on revenue, and now they, they are super uh, prosperous. Um, so, but it's a conscious choice that needed to be made to let go of one aspect that was part of the identity of that individual, and so that he could experience a new aspect of him and, in this case, his company. Uh, mm -hmm. so that uh, they can both uh, be happy together, I guess. Uh, but more importantly, explore new challenges or, or new aspects that uh, will help them to, to grow further. Does that make sense? It does, because I, I was thinking as, you, as you're talking there about the phenomena we experienced in the early stages of, of COVID, lockdown, that completely shifted people's perspective on can't we can't do that we can't do that we can't do that suddenly mm -hmm. we had to and we did yeah. mm -hmm. and it, all those rules we've been hanging on to that we about working from home working remotely how can we manage people we can't see them from a business perspective all those things um globally went out the window overnight and businesses reacted quickly and what frustrates me is that we've got a short mind what we're saying now is we're all trying to control it back again we're saying We've got major global CEOs saying, well, if I can't see you, I can't trust you. We need everyone back in our office because it works better for creativity. It works better for this. Better. And you think it, that, that negates the lived experience of all of their employees who are going, hang on a minute, I was working really, really hard. We were, we, we were very productive because th there is a certain mindset amongst maybe senior leaders, senior leadership teams, where the control is still necessary. And as you say, there's the, the, the feminine and the masculine elements here. Mm -hmm. And we, the control is coming back in with the masculine type trust. I think trust is a big thing here. 
I can't see you. I can't trust you. I can't control you. And people get nervous. They, they feel that, what's my purpose if I'm not in charge, in control? That's the mantra we've tried to say. Leaders must be in charge, in control. And what we've proved is we, leaders don't know. Leaders are as vulnerable as everybody else. They're all in that same boat together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're, we're, we're forgetting that. And we're trying to go back to where we were. And I think you said at the beginning how we're in this cyclical kind of, we keep repeating the exactly. lessons and we're not, we're not really learning. See, uh, all these cycles are like a pendulum. We, we go one way, we explore what it is to be super controlling, for instance. That's where we're coming from. And then we went the other way, which is nobody at, in the office. And now we're going this way and we're saying, oh, maybe it's not that good. And then, you know, so it's always seeking that average point that makes sense, the balance. Uh, hmm. That's what life is about, uh, f- finding the new balance again and again and again. And if there is no tension, no balance can be found. And with the tension comes the contrast that allows me to see, oh, maybe I want to choose something else, which hmm. is what we were talking about earlier too. And that brings me to a new place where I can, uh, again, visit a new aspect of me, me being a company, me being a society of me being an individual. It's the same thing. Uh, and it, it helps me to go from a state of cacophony to a state of symphony um, at some point and whenever I'm ready for it. Right. And that's the gist of our whole life. And uh, for, or any company, any team, any CEO, any leader of their own, of our own lives. I see something similar happening when we when we talk about diversity and inclusion or diversity in the workplace or in society. We most people would say, yes, we want fairness, yes, we want equity, yes, we want people to succeed. And then we try and look at anti-racism, we try and look at anti homophobia, all these kind of solutions. And what happens is it has momentum. And then people who are maybe in the privileged group go, hang on a minute, well, you're you're catching up with me too quickly. You know, the change is too fast. We need to put the brakes on this. We can't We can't just rush into this. We need to slow it down. And of course, that creates this tension, this pendulum, as you're saying, where the people have been used to having this momentum. People who have privilege start to rebel back and go, hang on a minute, you're, you're now denying me as a white person the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that gets caught. And I, and I always think it's, it's a signal that change is occurring because you get this back pressure. It's almost mm-hmm. like this fight back. Mm-hmm. It means we've just got to keep that momentum going and mm-hmm. hold our ground and, and not let, if you like, the, the incumbent thinking stop and take it over. Because I think it's going back to what you're saying, is if, if the, the people who have the power, who have the privilege, who are saying no, reframed, they stop, they pause and go, what am I really losing? What am I gain- What's the world got to gain? We talk about ESGs, we talk about all these things and equality and diversity is all baked into the heart of that sustainability, looking after our planet, climate change. If we start becoming resistant to this, all we're doing is creating a, a society that is, is going to hit some buffers, mm-hmm. you know, probably in our, in our lifetime, we're going to have some significant changes. Well, if not, if not already, just looking at the way the ice caps are mounting the, the global warming. I, if I get to my 75 years old, there will be some significant changes in the next 15 to 20 years, let alone my, my grandchildren and uh, the future generations they're going to have to face where we've, we've cashed a lot of checks and we've created a massive earth overdraft that we're going to have to start paying back. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Oh no, it's been fascinating talking to you. I've, I've loved our conversation and, we hadn't really had a conversation before. Well, we hadn't had a conversation before today, and no, we picked just up everything it. from. We just, just this is just the beginning of our conversation, so it's been absolutely fascinating coming into a podcast like this, really not knowing what we were going to talk about, and just exploring this and find that there's there's so much synergy and so many concepts that you raise that resonate with me deeply, and it's been fascinating. So, thank you so much for your time and and thank being on. You. It's uh, really a, a pleasure to have had this conversation. A very very how can people get hold of you what's the best way uh, of people so you know i have a website uh, tapuat.com t-a-p-u-a-t.com where they can find my books the 
We have a cruise on the Nile uh, to help people find harmony within. Then we have uh, um, the heartful method for groups or individual guidance as well. And, uh, you know, I'm animating um, workshops in Zurich and maybe in London soon and, um, and seeing, you know, how we can help more and more people to, to grow into their, into their own heart and, uh, and find that love that they have already, but they forgot it. So it's uh, all a matter of, yeah, how can we live in harmony with ourselves and find that music that we hold inside and uh, bring, bring it out in the world as a symphony. I love that. So find the love they've forgotten and bring it out as a symphony, all those sort of multi, multi strands of our, of our essence, um, yes. all different instruments. Yes. Yeah. The wind, the, the string and the, the percussion all coming it's together. Making that beautiful music. That's, that's uh, all, all good. And, uh, oh, a mix of thereof, right. And, um, and, and, and we also help teams uh, to, find coherence. I was uh, organizing a cruise with 60 change makers and we helped them to uh, rebalance the feminine and the masculine energies that were really creating a lot of issues. And so that also is, you know, the same thing, whether it's a, an individual or a team, bringing them from a place of cacophony to a place of symphony. That's the whole thing. And uh, it, you know, it's a gift we can give to ourselves if we choose to. It's an amazing one, really. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. A huge thank you also to our listeners uh, for tuning in, getting to the end today. Please do keep uh, subscribed to keep updates on future episodes of the Inclusion Bites podcast. That's B-I-T-E-S. Please share with your friends and colleagues. I've got a number of other exciting guests lined up. I'm sure you'll be equally inspired by over the next few weeks and months. And also, if you'd like to be a guest, please let me know. I'd love to have you on the show. And of course, I always welcome feedback and suggestions on for future shows on how we can improve. Uh, just email me, joe.lockwood at cchangehappen.co.uk. Finally, my name is Joanne Lockwood. It's been an absolute pleasure to host this podcast for you today. Catch you next time. Bye.